Hi everyone, on behalf of Magnus and myself, uh, we want to welcome you to the public workshop of HEXA-X. HEXA-X, the flagship research projects in Europe to define the future of the next generation network, to lay the foundational blueprint of 6G. But before talking about 6G, let's have a look at the previous generations. Our industry has been very good at turning out a new generation every decade. And with every de generation, new radio technologies aimed for higher frequencies and wider and wider bands. Every generation was also defined by a new platform, new compute that enabled new applications as well as new network platforms. We moved from analog to synchronous digital in GSM. Magnus and I will remember the research on ATM in our generation leading to UMTS in 3G and then packet-based IP and Ethernet for LTE in 4G. In 5G, we embraced the cloud technologies with network function virtualization and SDN. Interestingly, also the fixed network followed these same generational shifts. As an example, ADSL, asymmetric DSL technology, used the same ATM technology and then VDSL moved on to Ethernet as the layer two technology. And interestingly also, the bandwidth of these different copper technologies are very similar to the radio technologies. And that's not surprising because the underlying silicon that enabled the digital signal processing was the same. But it's not only about technology, it's also about the defining application, very important. The application that sets the direction for the specification and also inspires the research. And in the beginning, it was all about voice, but very soon with 3G, it became about uh, data access, internet access, enabling video. And with 5G, for the first time, we're connecting also machines. So a defining new radio technology, defining new platform technology, and a defining new application. And there's also uh, unexpected applications. There's always some uncertainty. In, in GSM, we had uh, SMS as the new unexpected application. In 4G, we had social media. Uh, I pay a beer for people that can tell me what the unexpected application will be in 5G. Now the question is, what will be those three important elements be for 6G? Well, it's already starting to be obvious in the research. We're getting excited about terahertz radio technologies and also in the existing spectrum, new approaches. The defining compute platform is going to be AIML not only for the applications, but also for, uh, new ways of designing the network and dealing with the complexity of the network. And then as the defining vision for the application, we see con continuous connectivity between physical worlds and biological worlds with digital twin models in the digital worlds. And I'm going to tell more about that in a minute. But while we're on this timeline, I also want to make another point. The European research project have been at the forefront of every generation. And in every generation, there has been a defining flagship project that laid the foundation. And there have been many other projects. And through concerted action, we made more of the sum of the parts. In 4G, the winner project was the defining project. And then the Wireless World Initiative took care of the coordination across the many research projects. In 5G, we had the METIS project. And then the coordination happened through the 5G public-private partnership. Now we are at 6G. HEXA-X is that defining flagship project for 6G research. And then the coordinated action will happen through the Smart Network and Services Initiative. We see that again here on this timeline. We see here the timeline for 5G and 6G. And in the research phase, we see in uh, upfront METIS, and then at the start of 6G, we have HEXA-X. And interestingly, uh, Ericsson was the coordinator, the project lead for METIS, and Nokia was the technical manager. And now we switched roles for HEXA-X. Nokia is the project manager, and Ericsson is the technical management. Let's look a bit at the 6G timeline. We are currently at the early concept phase. Uh, the definition phase, and our research will be accompanied by other research projects also on more enabling technologies, and that will lead to a next phase of projects in, in uh, Horizon Europe on new use cases and more systematization uh, and, and, and trials. Going 
forward. This actually lays the foundation for the requirement collection and the start of standardization. And there is a, a fair consensus in the industry that standardization for 6G will start around the mid of the decade with first specifications in 2028 and then first commercial deployments around 2030. But at the start of the specifications, it's very important to understand what will be the defining applications. And here the vision is, well, first let's uh, remind us what a defining definition was for 5G, the connection of uh, humans and machines. In 6G, our vision is that we will have a much richer connectivity of the physical world, of our own human biological world, and synchronous connectivity to digital twin models of the physical world, of our human biological world in the digital world. And those digital twin models are important. They help us to get a better understanding of the world thanks to massive scale deployment of sensing and massive scale deployment of AIML. And that is helping us to anticipate need and automate control and uh, positive outcomes back into the physical world. Also the human biological world and the digital twinning of that helps with uh, better healthcare, but also making the human machine interface more intuitive. To achieve this vision, we have identified six goals in HexaX. There must be six for 6G, right? We will start with uh, uh, connecting the intelligence of digital worlds and uh, the other worlds. We will then go for extreme uh, networks of networks with at the endpoints, again, networks machine area network, a body area network with uh, very specialized requirements. And all this needs to happen with sustainability. Sustainability as in energy efficient, but also sustainable as in bridging the digital divide, giving equal access to everyone, providing global coverage, and then all also providing extreme connectivity and experiences, pushing the limits of uh, the spider diagram. And all that needs to happen with security and trust. Now, how that will happen and what the technology challenges and use cases are, for that, I hand it over to Magnus. Thank you, Peter. Let me continue to talk about the 60 technologies and scenarios that we see in front of us. Let's start by looking a little bit at the fundamental technology forces. So, we, 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 we see very, very strong exponential technology forces that will, will drive sort of our industry forward and enabling a lot of possibilities. The first one is, of course, the ubiquitous connectivity, where we see the, the sort of the rollout of 5G and all the new use cases that 5G will, will be an enable and, and all the momentum around the possibilities of connecting things, right? So that is definitely happening now, coming the coming 10 years. But there's so much more happening, right? The fact that we are connecting a lot of these IoT devices will make it possible to, to get a lot of new data into the network and into the applications using the, the network. And this will, of course, lead to a lot of new possibilities when we apply the very strong development we see in the AI field on top of this, this new data that we are collecting. Doing that, you also will need a lot of compute and, and we see how the, the cloud compute is being rolled out and we see how there's very, very strong trend of, of, trend of distributing this compute out to the edge of the network. And it's really then when, when it comes together, right, the, the, the 5G connectivity with the short delays, all the data that you get, the AI capabilities and the close by compute capabilities. But this is not enough. We also see the trend of increasing the, the trustworthiness of these systems. And, and here we have, of course, a lot to work with in the complete ecosystem in order to be able to provide the safety and, and the, the security, the service assurance, uh, everything around the use cases in order to be able to address the most challenging mission critical use cases. Then to get something to happen in reality we need the robots, right? So we need the actuators and, and also here we see a very, very strong development. And then we as persons would like to be able to move between this sort of digital representation of the world and the physical world. 
And here, of course, we have everything around uh, augmented reality applications. And there is a strong uh, development also here with more and more attractive devices coming onto the market. As you realize, there's a lot of compute going on here, a lot of software. And uh, in order to carry all of these AI loads in an energy efficient way, we need more and new computing possibilities. And there are some interesting paradigm shifts in front of us. Of course, everybody's talking about quantum, but closer might be the neuromorphic compute capabilities that we're also looking into. Uh, and the same thing with the compute, we also need energy for this. And, and then, of course, we need to be able to use the green energy. And that is produced in a very distributed manner. This infrastructure we talk about here is also sort of distributed. So we need to be able to connect these two infrastructures in order to feed uh, our then compute and communication and, and all of these applications with, with the, the, the needed energy. There is also more fundamental research going on when it comes to smart materials, etc. So all of these are well known, but it's really you see how they are reinforcing each other and making this to be a truly exponential development in front of us. Let me focus a little bit on the interaction between the digital and the physical world. We are calling this the cyber-physical continuum. And here we have sort of the, the physical world. We will see a lot of different sensors in this world. That, that will bring a lot of data into the digital world. And here we will have the programmable digital representation then of the physical world, where we will do a different sort of, we will be able to learn about how the different objects, environments are acting. And based on that, we will be able to simulate what we would like to do in the physical world. And, and we can then pick the actions that, that will lead to the wanted outcome. And then we will send the actions back to the, the physical world. And there we have the actuators and that, that will then perform these, these actions. So we really see here how the, the physical world consists of the sensing, the actions, the experience. And then the digital is the programmable representation of this physical world. And in between here, we have the network. And if you pull this apart a little bit and look at the intersection between the physical world and the digital world, you realize that there is a lot of connectivity needed across that interface. So we will have the connected intelligent machines that will need to communicate to each other and to communicate to their digital twins. We will have the Internet of Senses, where we will have these immersive experiences, uh, and that will also be truly dependent on the fact that we need a digital representation for the spatial mapping and everything for these services to be a good experience. And the synchronization between the physical world and the digital world is really dependent on the fact that we are able to have the fully updated digital representation of the physical world. So looking a little bit closer to this, uh, these use cases. So we have the Internet of Senses, this immersive experience. We have the telepresence. We have a lot of these merged things, so merged reality, game and work situations. And you can think about a lot of sort of entertainment, immersive, immersive sports, for example. Uh, the connected intelligent machines is more sort of a new, a new thing that, that we will see. And, and here we will have these interacting robots and that will be heavily used in an industry 4.0 situation in, in a sort of a very flexible, fully digitalized manufacturing site, for example. On the digitalized and programmable physical world, what we will need is sort of the, the maps. And, and these are, of course, 3D maps, but they also over time. So you can talk about the 4D, 4D maps. By this, creating these digital twins of everything, including our own bodies, so you can have your digital twin. That will open a lot of, lot of interesting things when it comes to position, health care, etc. And of course, all of these sensors that we will have around us will really be this infrastructure of all of these sensing information. Sustainability will be key, will be sort of enabled by these possibilities of the, of the networks. And of course, you can think about really providing a lot of good services for all citizens. And it could be e-health, you can have the monitor of the earth with all the sensors, and there is a lot of, of gains to be seen in the supply chains. So if you want to build this, 
you can realize that there is a lot of, of needed capabilities of the future 6G network platforms. And this is, of course, very much sort of still open research. We, we are working on this. We have just started to look at what could be the key technologies in order to be able to, to build a network infrastructure uh, providing all of these future services. So if you try to look a little bit in the needs, I think we in the center there, we will have all the classical requirements. We just need more capacity, with even lower latency, even more accurate positioning, even more coverage and capacity and higher data rates. Everything we, we used to talk about, we need more of that. But then I think we have a set of, of new requirements which uh, haven't been that clearly expressed in, in previous generations and that we see now becoming higher and higher on the, on the set of, of things that is already asked for now in, in the 5G use cases. And this will, of course, be even more asked for to fully sort of have this digitalized uh, programmable world. So if you want to do that, you, you would need even more sort of security and privacy. The service availability needs to be guaranteed. Then there need to be the capability of hosting the different applications. The, the sensing will be integrated into the, to the network. And there will also be a lot of different types of devices connected to these networks. So it will be both sort of these smart dust things to extremely capable machinery. So looking even further down into the, the network platform, what, what are the key characteristics of this network platform we see in front of us? The classical one here again is of course the connectivity. We talk about the limitless connectivity, providing all the, all the needed connectivity for these services. But it's also so that the level of trust needs to be increased significantly. So that's a key area to look into. Then in order to handle the complexity and providing the flexibility that would be required from all of these different uh, new services we see, we need to be data driven, it, it has to be sort of self-learning, and then we need this fully cognitive network. And finally, if you want to have the full performance, you need to have the compute very, very close to the network. And we are even claiming that you need to, to simultaneously integrate the connectivity and the compute, and we call it the network compute fabric. And with that, back to you, Peter. Okay, thank you, Magnus. Uh, a few more things before we wrap up this keynote. So lots of things are happening in Europe, but actually also in the global ecosystem for 6G. In Europe, we have not only HexaX, the 6G flagship project, but many other uh, projects. We have the Smart Network and Services Initiative that we already mentioned. But then also in every country, there are regional initiatives like the very first uh, Genesis 6G project in Finland and the 6G hubs uh, that are now uh, being defined in Germany. In China and in Asia, we see lots of things happening as well. You, you, you can read for yourself, well, or, or maybe you cannot read, but you can, if you don't read Chinese, but you can see that lots of things are happening. And then also in the US, Magnus and I actually had very early on discussions on how we can uh, bring the good collaboration practices of Europe to the US ecosystem. And our discussions early on with ATIS and with NSF have been very influential for the setup of NextG Alliance and also the NSF uh, 6G pr program uh, called Rings that was launched a few weeks ago. And I want to make a special call to the universities in the US to have a look at this because this is going to be an exciting opportunity. One last thing, uh, HEXA-X, we also have an advisory group. Uh, Magnus and I are actually co-chairing that advisory group. And I want to say a thank you here at this point to the members. As you can see, these members are very senior research leaders and CTO from different parts of the globe and also from different segments in the industry. And that with the goal to provide an outside in perspective uh, from different directions and provide guidance to the research in the HEXA-X project. And with that, uh, I want to thank you for your attention and we look forward to an exciting workshop and what you hear what you already have to define the blueprint for 6G.
Thank you.